Hi, I'm Antonia. This is Universally Me. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Clubhouse at Antonia Carlotta. And check out my Patreon where I've got a ton of bonus old Hollywood content. I got a few requests recently to make a video about Mary Philbin and, well, it just felt like time. I am now more than 90 videos in on my channel and we are finally getting to one of the great female icons of the silent era. Mary Philbin actually had a close connection to my family. She was friends with the Lemleys when they lived back in Chicago and she and my Aunt Carla were good friends for most of her life. I just wish that my Aunt Carla were still around. I would have asked her a thousand questions making this video, but I just gotta work with what I got. So let's talk about Mary Philbin. Mary Loretta Philbin was born July 16th, 1902 in Chicago, Illinois to John and Mary Philbin. And that's not a mistake. Her mom did have the same name as her, though her mom would be baptized as Blanche and that's what people would usually call her. Mary's dad had immigrated to the US from Ireland a couple years earlier, and the family was quite observantly Catholic. And you're gonna to wanna to remember that fact because it will come back around later. Little Mary, as she was sometimes called, was a beautiful child, and her mom, who could be a little controlling, loved to show her off. I definitely get vibes of overprotective, overbearing stage mom. Mary, though, was really shy and quiet. One of her few friends growing up was my Aunt Carla. Mary's reserved personality was much more like her father's, and the two of them were very close. When she was young, he started taking her to see plays, or shows at the Chicago Opera House. And Mary absolutely loved it. She decided that she really wanted to be a part of that world. She started playing piano and pipe organ and she enrolled in dance classes. Like I said, one of Mary's only friends when she was a kid was my Aunt Carla Lemley. They would play and dance together and through their friendship, their parents became very close too. When Carla's dad, Joseph, told Mary about film and she saw her first Nickelodeon, Mary was hooked. And she decided that rather than the stage, she wanted to get into movies. The story Carla always told was that Universal was holding a beauty contest in Chicago with the Benevolent Order of the Elks. I've seen it referred to in some places as the Beauty and Brains Contest, and I think it partnered with a local Chicago newspaper. These beauty contests were pretty common back in the day, not too different from your casting calls or showcases that you might see today. Mary, now age 17, entered the contest and really impressed the judges with her beauty and her charm. She came in second place, but Joseph called up Carl Lemley and really went to bat for Mary. He convinced Carl to give her a chance and he told her to come out to Universal. Though Mary's parents were supportive of her entering the contest, her mother had even helped her pick the submission picture that they used. They were less stoked about letting her move to Los Angeles, which I get it. But Joseph spoke to them and said that he and his family were about to make the move to Universal too. If you want to hear about my Aunt Carla's experience growing up on the lot, which was absolutely magical, you should check out the interview that I did with her when she was 104 years old. I think it was comforting to Mary's parents that the Lemleys were moving to California too. They decided that they would all make the move. But her parents never relinquished control, her mother especially. She was always on set with Mary and always keeping a watchful eye on her. Carl gave Mary a one-year contract and she was excited to get to work. Her first role was supposed to be the lead in Eric von Stroheim's Blind Husbands, but when Mary got to LA, she found out she'd been replaced. She considered turning around and going back to Chicago right then and there, but she stayed and she was instead cast in two other films, The Blazing Trail and Danger Ahead. Audiences found her so charming, especially given her young age. Though she missed her first opportunity to work with Eric von Stroheim, she would get another in 1922 on Universal's Foolish Wives, their most expensive film at the time. Eric von Stroheim really enjoyed working with Mary and supposedly convinced Carl Lemley and Irving Thalberg to start using her more. She was suddenly everywhere, always working on a film and always in the magazines and papers. Then, in 1924, Mary was cast in the role that she is most remembered for today, 
The Phantom of the Opera. She and my Aunt Carla were both in that movie. It also starred another little actor called Lon Chaney, who you may have heard about in my Lon Chaney video or in my Lon Chaney tour of Colorado Springs. We all know what a classic The Phantom of the Opera is, but what I think people don't usually know is that that shoot was not a fantastic shoot. There's actually so much to cover here that I'm gonna make that its own video, but I can tell you that Mary did not have it easy on that set. First, for some reason, Rupert Julian was sort of obsessed with Mary, and he was always adjusting her costume and her wig really inappropriately. It got so bad that at one point, Rupert's wife had to step in and take over. And Norman Carey was known to get pretty handsy with Mary too. And for a young religious girl, kind of new to Hollywood, this had to have been rather traumatizing. And then Rupert struggled with directing to the point that Lon Chaney and my uncle Ernst Lemley both stepped in to direct some scenes. And though Mary had her good looks and her charm, she wasn't a well-trained actress and it was kind of a struggle for her sometimes. I'm sure it couldn't have helped to have this rotation of directors around her. And I heard stories of Lon Chaney berating her to tears to get the right shots and then immediately apologizing after, explaining it was just for the movie, but that couldn't have been a pleasant experience. And I wish that I could say that kind of behavior ended in the 1920s, but I have even heard of directors using that tactic today. Mary continued acting with starring roles in Stella Maris, Surrender, Drums of Love, The Man Who Laughs, and Port of Dreams. I wish that I could say with each film her acting talent got better, but it didn't necessarily improve. And then when sound films came in, it was even worse. Her voice was rather high pitched, sometimes described as being like a little girl's and having a less than attractive voice with insufficient acting abilities meant that by 1930, her career was pretty much over. Her last film was 1929's After the Fog. And I feel pretty bad saying that the next 60 years of her life can be wrapped up in about 60 seconds, but that's pretty much the case. There's one more thing we haven't talked about yet though, and that is Mary's love life. And that could really be a movie all its own, though it would be a pretty sad one. In 1923, Eric von Stroheim introduced Mary Philbin to Paul Koner, who was working for my uncle Carl at Universal. The two of them started dating and were very much in love, but they had to keep their love a secret because Paul was Jewish and Mary's Irish Catholic parents would never approve. In May of 1926, Paul proposed to Mary and she gladly accepted, but even their engagement they kept a secret for some time. Later that year, Mary finally revealed her engagement to her parents, but her mom was furious. She would absolutely never allow her daughter to marry Paul because he was Jewish. And if Mary didn't listen, she was ready to disown her. Mary really did think about cutting off her family for her love, but ultimately she just couldn't do it. And she and Paul broke off their engagement. She and Paul were both devastated. The two of them would keep love letters from each other for the rest of their lives. And now Mary, without her love and without a career to look forward to either, she became rather reclusive. She moved into her father's house and helped to care for her parents. Her mom would die just a few years later in 1934, but by that time, Paul Koner had already married actress Lupita Tovar. Mary's father would live until 1948. Mary Philbin was all but forgotten for decades, living in her old family home and going to church. It must have been pretty lonely sometimes. I know that my Aunt Carla remained friends with her, and I know that when Mary started showing early signs of Alzheimer's, Carla would go help her out. Mary wouldn't make another public appearance until 1988 at Rudy Valentino's memorial service, and finally at a performance of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Phantom of the Opera in downtown LA. On May 7th, 1993, Mary passed away from pneumonia at 90 years old in Huntington Beach. 
She now rests at the Calvary Cemetery in Whittier, California. Some of my Aunt Carla's favorite memories included Mary Philbin. She would often talk of them dancing and playing, of birthday parties that Mary had been there for, or even running through the Universal Costume Warehouse and trying on different outfits. I'm really happy that they had their friendship and that that friendship lasted through their lifetimes. Post your favorite Mary Philbin films below and check out my Patreon for more that didn't make this video. Follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Clubhouse at Antonia Carlotta. Thank you so much for watching.